that was, uh, it's hard for me to have a game face up here, <laughs> you know, after that. It was a very, very moving work. Um, would you like to share anything about the sh the movie after seeing it, maybe for the 15th time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and if you could use your mic, if you don't mind. First of all, thank you for coming and watching this film. Um, I started writing this in 2005, and it was after reading newspaper articles about um, teenage suicides on reserves, and it always seems to uh, show up. And all of a sudden, it's like, you know, 10 teenagers have committed suicide on this reserve and that reserve. So I thought, as an artist, what can you do about it? And the only thing I can think of is creating something. Hopefully somebody can watch it and enjoy it. And maybe they'll think, oh, I, I would like to try and do that too. So that's where the initial um, idea comes from. Around the same time on the CBC, and it always happens just before Christmas, uh, it happened about three years in a row. And they would show young um like babies and they'd be covered in scabs and they'd say there was like, um, they couldn't figure out what was going on. And this was in Northern Ontario and uh, reports would come back. They're not being properly washed and all this sort of thing. But it would, but at the same time, there's factories and uh, is it gold mines? Something like that. And they put arsenic into the waterways and, you know, it really affects everybody who lives with, in that area. So to see that they're not being properly washed or bathed, that just doesn't really make sense. So that's, you know, people often ask me, what's with Charlie B? And uh, that's where that comes from. I also wanted to think about um, uh, girls and women, and I want them to be kind of uh, like... Um, Mitzi Bearclaw, she's the main character in the film. And she, you know, she's really kind of self-centered in the beginning. And uh, she doesn't want to go home, doesn't want to help out, doesn't want to uh, go back to the reserve, like who would want to. But for her, because of the love of her father, she does go back. Mm -hmm. And within that year, her life changes. That's the incredible part. Um, what else is there? <laughs> But I think it's, you know, it was as I was watching it this time, it's like, yeah, there's an environmental message that's kind of put in there, but it's not over your head, like banging you on the head. But I just wanted to uh, talk about those communities that are affected by, you know, those corporations that kind of don't give a damn about what happens to uh, people or animals. That's why you see the fish in the water and uh, all that kind of thing. I don't know. Can you talk a little bit about the process of filmmaking? Um, maybe this one as an example. Uh, it's long. It's hard. It's uh, <laughs> um, you really have to become obsessed about making a film. You have to become obsessed about the story you want to tell. Because if you're not, you know, you can just walk away at any point and say, "Yeah, I don't want to do that." Um, and then you have to work on the script in a way that people become, they want to become involved in, in the making of the story. And, uh, you know, when, when you start getting people interested and excited, that's when filmmaking really becomes fun. Also, I like to stress fun because if you're not having fun when you're doing this and you really shouldn't be doing it because otherwise you're going to drive yourself crazy and everybody else around you crazy. Um, but it's a long process. Nothing comes fast or easy, but uh, for me anyways, I always have to uh, put in my time and, and wait for the results to start to show up. I don't know what other kind of, what other process. Uh, and did, didn't you say it took a, how long did it take to make this? Yeah, I started writing it in 2005 and 
It was finally produced in 2017. So that's 15 years. I was so young when I started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, every, I was just thinking about every single character I fell in love with. There was something so beautiful about every single character and so multi-dimensional other than the muskrat. <laughs> <laughs> and they were too, <laughs> which is wonderful. Just, um, I love that, that you show people that a, a certain way at first and then that well-roundedness that you don't see in a lot of movies. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's one of the challenges, trying to not uh, make them two-dimensional characters. You know, you really want to show... Um, more sides than just one side. We can um, open it up to anybody who would like to have a question for Shelley. When Charlie B died and Mitzi and her mother were in bed, you know, and her mother was explaining to her uh, why she couldn't spread her love you know, for all the children. And she put it all into Charlie B. And then she said something, I think, where she became hardened and had some hate. Why did that develop? And why couldn't she give them all the same attention? Right. Um, Annabelle is a residential school survivor, and she was really kind of, you know, she was from that um, generation who was really hardened and they really weren't nurtured in a way where they could express love but lucky for her Charlie B came along and you know she managed to uh, find her way out of that just for him though right so so you're saying that before before he came into her life she was already hardened because she because she had gone to a boarding school yeah and uh so she wasn't when she was even before him, she wasn't there to nurture her her kids. And when he came into her life, he brought some light, but she only gave it to him, to her love. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, she talked about her sister as well, and her sister passed away. And then, um, you know, she just became more hardened as well. But again, when Charlie showed up, then I think she had that door open again. Okay. First was the loon call because it often happened when there wouldn't normally be loons on those northern Ontario lakes. And the second was why you chose to make her a hat maker. Thank you. Um, I thought, who makes hats? <laughs> so I just wanted her to, you know, totally explore something that nobody else was doing at the time. You know, just like um, she could be designing bicycle tires or something like this. But I thought hats was kind of um, uh, a goofy project to pursue. Oh, the loons. Well, loons are uh, from northern Ontario. And uh, I thought using loons, it just will, you know, kind of put you um, in a location that that they're kind of out there, you know. Thank you. Yeah. Can you talk a bit about the dream fantasy sequences? What Were there any films that inspired you while you were preparing to shoot them? Um, did you use storyboards? And also, what were those days on set like? Uh, well, for one thing, it's supposed to take a place over a year. We shot it in June. We had 18 days. It was really hot, super hot. So we had to, they really had to act, like pretend they were cold. Um, and I, it was really kind of a, a fun set to be on because all the actors were like, you know, they're just fun to be around. And um, I don't know, what was the other question? 
Were there any films that inspired you when planning? Yeah, there's lots of films that inspire me. I can't think of any of them now, but I think I always come back to dreams, Kurosawa's dreams, and, um, you know, going into those other worlds. And when I think about, when I was thinking about um, Mitzi and her uh, ancestral guides, you know, they're out in space or they're in the bush or even the the nightmare scene. Um, I just try to think of, I can't think of anything right now. But yeah, I you know I probably did, but I can't. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Or different worldly sequences. When I first started seeing them in the film, they it was like stepping into one of the the artworks. Stepping into one of the artworks that you have that are in the exhibition, that um, but it added dimension and it added time, um, which is very different from what photography often does. And I was wondering what that felt like you, to you to take one medium that you're familiar with and move it into more dimensions. Yeah, uh, when I was designing those pieces, it was like, um, you know, her being alone, back in uh, on this island, separated from the rest of the world. And uh, let me think, I had an answer now, I can't think of it. <laughs> but um, I really wanted it to feel like the ancestors were with her, you know, and I wanted her to feel like it was otherworldly. And she, uh, she understood it. She wasn't afraid of them. She knew they were there because she comes back and she said, I was wondering when you're going to show up. And they do show up and they say, you know, we're always here for you. So, you know, uh, it, um, don't be afraid and just keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. I can't think of anything else. <laughs> that is a really great point about an installation. I mean, it is move movies. Your movies are a moving installation piece because they have so many elements, I think, of your own artwork itself. I hadn't thought about that. I thought of it as like art, but in terms like of an installation piece. Have you worked on an installation? Do you, have you had an installation piece? Not yet. That's okay. Yeah, it's on. Um, no, I think that's the beauty of making film. Yeah. You take in into consideration the composition, the dialogue, the actors, um, the the soundtrack, all those things. You know, you can really, you can really make it as full as you want to, and that's, and when you do that, it's like, wow, that's amazing. So it's, you know, when you're working with so many people too, then it becomes um, such a great project to be working with. Because uh, usually as an artist, you're in your studio by yourself, days on end. Um, and then when you're working on a movie set, you know, if everybody's working, getting along together, then it's uh, so much fun. Uh, I think with the uh, one part where Mitzi is confronted by the muskrats, it's a nightmare scene. And I don't know if it comes across, but sh in this part, she's like, she's uh, the earth. And the muskrats are um, in the script when I was writing, it was the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which is pestilence, war, money, and uh, what's the other one? Oil, something. And they're like really after her, like, we're going to get you, you know, you're so dumb. We're going to just uh, uh, drive you down. But she escapes and her ancestors come along and help her again. Um, this is on her. Um, this is a little bit off the track, but. What did you think about the Barbie movie? I didn't see it. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing was, uh, I was going to ask a question, and did you take any inspiration from uh, Sherman Alexi or our Coen Brothers movies? Um, I don't think so. I hope not. Um... <laughs> oh, no, don't say that. They're, 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 they're pretty uh, impressive. <laughs> Uh, let me think. Inspiration. You know who I do like is Wes Anderson. 
because he his films are just so they're just so pure, you know, and I really like that. We get those movies too. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I, yeah, I think so. I think there's like you know there's a cultural divide there. Uh, I don't know why, but um, you know we're so obvious, we're so sensitive to that. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks everybody. Let's give a applaud our applause a hand to Shelley and thank you, sir, for. For such a wonderful afternoon, you really um, your your film is so moving and beautiful, and I hope that so many people share how beautiful it is to family and friends. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. <laughs>